The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Welcome to Reasonably Speaking. Today, we're going to talk about consumer contracts with two recognized experts in this area of law, Omri Ben-Shahar and Florencia Morota wargler Omri is the Leo and Eileen Hartzell Professor of Law and Kearney Director and Founder of the Coase Sander Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Chicago Law School. He teaches contracts, sales, insurance law, consumer law, e-commerce, food and drug law, law and economics, and game theory in the law. He writes in the fields of contract law and consumer protection. Florencia is a professor at NYU Law and the director of NYU Law Abroad in Buenos Aires. Her teaching and research interests are in the areas of contracts, consumer privacy, electronic commerce, and law and economics. Her published research has addressed various problems associated with standard form contracts online, such as the effectiveness of disclosures, delayed presentation of terms, and whether or not Florencia, people read Omri, the fine print. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. We're here to talk about consumer contract law, which is treated differently than the way a lot of people think about contracts in a business-to-business sense. Omri, can you get us started by telling me why it's important to treat consumer contracts differently? Consumer enter transactions, not contracts. They don't have lawyers to help them draft the contracts. They don't think of the legal terms. When they enter that transactions, they want to buy products or services and they know they're going to pay money and they understand that there are some things that they get with it come along, but they are not part to this underlying legal infrastructure that's called contracting. And yet they also realize that they sometimes click, I agree to many things that contracts are there in the background to govern the legal aspects of the transaction. Unlike businesses, they consumers don't have the capacity of time, uh, experience, and knowledge to scrutinize and to read and to understand and to be prudent about the contracts that they are agreeing to. So we need a body of law that's called consumer contract law to figure out what exactly are consumers obligated to and what are they entitled to. Business-to-business contracts evolve over time because businesses have a chance to negotiate. Do consumers have that ability when they're entering into these contracts? Not at all. Not only is there no negotiation, so businesses know that they're entering into an agreement, they each have something at stake, they each know what they want out of it or what they don't want from it, so there's some negotiation anticipated. Even if there isn't, even if there's a standard form agreement, they're aware of it. In consumer contracts, not only negotiation is not a question, but many times consumers are not even aware of many of the terms that accompany the transaction. As Omri stated, consumers go to write it because they want to buy a toothbrush or toothpaste. They don't expect that the receipt is going to be, I mean, they're surprised that it's very, very long. Sometimes it's just folded and put it in the bag. But when you look at the back of it, there's many different clauses now. So arbitration clauses or other types of terms, sometimes terms that are that are pretty crazy, like on disparagement clause. They're very different in the sense that not only they're not negotiated, many of the terms are unexpected or unknown. I like two things that you both just said. I like that you called it a transaction, and I like that you pointed out that there might be a contract that you didn't even realize was there. That leads me to believe that we're entering into these more often than we think. Can you give me some examples of everyday contracts that I may have entered in today, that our listeners may have entered into this week, and that they may not realize they walked into? There's a write-in receipt. There's every single app that you use as a contract with terms attached. So for example, if you have an Instagram account, you might not know or be aware that that Instagram or or firms might be using the pictures that you take to advertise or or to for commercial purposes. So so very private or pictures that feel uh, very personal might be plastered all over in a way that you might not know about. Yeah, I mean, I think that this precedes the era of digital contracting. Every time we walked into a coffee shop to buy a latte, we enter a contract. We think of it as a latte for $4. But what if there is some object in the car? What if we got, if there was some unexpected consequence? Who is liable and how much? How the dispute be resolved? 
What if I paid too much or too little? What are the rights of the parties? So every transaction that consumers enter from, you know, forever, this has been forever, every transaction is a contract, has a contract in it. Most of the time, you know, 999 out of a thousand cases, consumers don't have to deal with the underlying legal terms. The performance terms, the service for the price concludes the transaction, but sometimes they do. Now, in the digital era, this has been heightened and multiplied, whereas walking in the old world into Walmart and buying something created a short contract with Walmart. There may be additional terms beyond the price and the product that we got, the right to return, the notice that was posted, and a few other things. Now, the contract, when you log into walmart.com, there's a much longer contract. It's easier to get consumers to agree to a longer pre-drafted set of terms. And that is, as Florencia mentioned, every visit in a website, every download, and every visit of an app is governed by terms that are very long, very meticulously drafted by one side, and that are purport to be binding on consumers. Consumer contract law has to figure out when they are. So tell me, on these contracts, how big are the stakes? Is this something that we should be paying attention to? Because they're so ubiquitous and they're so long, it, we could stay all day reading agreements. So reading them would just be crazy. That's all we do all day. The stakes can be very, very big. That doesn't mean that we should read them all the time, because then we would just be doing only that. But sometimes the stakes are very big, sometimes they're not. That depends on, on the luck of the draw sometimes and the type of transaction that could happen. That does not mean that we should be reading them. And I think we kind of agree on that. Yeah. I think the stakes are large for businesses because while the terms might not come into play in every single transaction and maybe only in a few, over the long haul, this, the, the stakes could be large. They could determine the scope of the business liability, the scope of the consumer's rights, and businesses want to know what they are exposed to, and they can limit or at least measure that exposure based on what is written in the standard contract term in order to design the things that consumers care about, the price and the right to return and things like that. The scope could also be large to consumers if they care about things that are in the standard contract terms. For example, one of the things that these terms do are they govern the data privacy, the so-called data privacy practices, of the business, what data the business can track and keep and share data that has to do with identifying the consumer and their habits. Uh, some consumers, there's debate on how many, but there's some consumers uh, dearly care about that. So the terms of the contracts matter to them. It seems to me that when we're talking about consumer privacy, it's in the digital world. Is that true? Am I interpreting that correctly? It's mostly when we're online that privacy becomes an issue. Well, it, it becomes an issue because online it's much easier to track what you do. So if you walk into Rite Aid and you go to the magazine rack and you look, you know, you're bored and you're waiting for the checkout line and you decide to read, I don't know, the National Enquirer because it's there, um, nobody's going to see you that you're doing that. But online, right? the firm that you're, the website that you're in, and also all the third parties that are tracking what you're doing are seeing every single page you check, where you go after, where you go before. If you're on your phone, not only do they get to see what you do, but it, for example, a game like Angry Birds can uh, get access to your photos, your emails, your texts, and your geolocation information. So uh, online, there's a, uh, there's a bigger opportunity for uh, a great number of firms to track everything you do and also to learn a lot about you, even more than you know about yourself. Many times when we have these surveys about our, surveys about our behavior, uh, they're very different. We have, we have a certain view of who we are that's very different of how we really behave. So actually firms sometimes know more about how we behave and our habits and what we do. Than, um, than ourselves. In fact, the other day, the, the new Apple software has this screen time device that tells you at the end of the day or at the end of the week how much you've used your phone. And, um, and I was a bit surprised about how much, I, uh, how much I use it. So Apple knows more about my phone usage than I know about myself. You agree? 
That's really interesting. Omri, do you agree? Yes, I think that the data aspect has become more and more important because data has become more and more important. Um, in the old world, consumer transaction, the most important consumer transactions, the largest companies that sold things to consumers were car companies. Now the largest companies in the world are all tech companies, and the only thing they get in return for what they produce is data. So obviously the contracts that they write are contracts about the data that they are allowed to keep. Just saying it, but it might not be but big exaggeration that Google's privacy policy a contract is possibly the most important consumer contract ever written. It governs such enormous stakes that were not matched in the pre-digital era. And going back to your original question about whether these are big stakes or small stakes, it's sometimes very hard for consumers to even understand, even rationally so, whether whether the stakes about giving one's information are big or small. First of all, we give information little bits at a time. We don't really know whether getting a, an ad that is annoying is relatively a small stake. So it's like, oh, I don't care about giving information in this particular manner. But for other individuals, having their location information shared might actually be a life or death situation if you have, for example, in the cases of some individuals, uh, stalkers or people who might uh, who might be interested in knowing where, some, where somebody is. So you don't really know the magnitude of potential benefit or, or, or damage that might arise from the terms that are in those in those agreements. I think that's a really good point. And I think as a consumer myself, and as consumers yourselves, it sounds like we often have to check the box mentally and just move on. And so we get a pop-up message when we're online with a series of terms. And we may have to scroll through what in a printout would be pages of potential terms. And we simply scroll to the bottom, click I agree, process it, and move on. When we do that behavior, when we're on autopilot to click the box and move on, are those terms enforceable? It depends. <laughs> it depends on how they're disclosed, which is somewhat ironic. You know, we have this doctrine and, and approach that if things are sufficiently disclosed and we have the opportunity to read, and Omri has written a, a lot about this, so I should let him talk about that, that those terms will be uh, well, enforceable, even though everybody knows that nobody reads. Because Florencia has proven this uh, in a very uh, nifty and persuasive, perhaps decisive way that people don't read this. Nevertheless, that is not the question for the law. It's not whether people read it or not. There's no requirement of informed consent, and wisely so, because it is impossible for people to spend time reading. They just don't have neither the time nor the mental capacity to understand what they're reading. It would be a very miserable living to read contracts like these all the time. So the, the requirement is, Florence says, that there needs to be a prominent notice alert to the consumers so that they know if they want to read, that they are able to. And if that exists, then those clicks, I agree, those uh, any kind of signifying of acceptance by the consumer is sufficient to adopt the entire set of terms. The answer is, by and large, businesses have learned to present the terms to consumers in a way that leads to their adoption. I think one of the most interesting consumer contracts out there is the one that you agree to before you ever see it. For example, the ones that are shrink-wrapped inside of the software box. So for example, I buy TurboTax every year. It's how I file my taxes. I can purchase it in Staples and then I walk out and I have the contract in my hand inside the box before I've ever opened the box. Will you talk to me a little bit about the notification that must be given to consumers in that instance? What it means to a consumer when they purchase something like that, are they initially entering into the contract before they've ever read it? If they have sufficient notice, right? So the famous case, ProCD versus Seidenberg, was the one that, that has been mostly followed and, and, it, and that case dictated that, yes, if you have, if it's it, sometimes it's very difficult to provide terms outside or, or before purchase. So sometimes it's not even that convenient. So if there's a notice that the terms are going to be uh, coming that alerts a consumer that the transaction is subject to additional terms and there is an opportunity to review that term, those terms after, and to 
reject or return the, the transaction or, or return the product without unreasonable burden, then those terms will be enforceable. And if nobody reads anything at all, then whether the terms that come before or after shouldn't matter so much. In fact, if you have an opportunity to reject it, it might actually be a little bit better. And in fact, in previous work, I found that the terms that come after, at least in some context, in the context of software license agreement, which is where, where they started, they're actually a tiny bit better than those that are uh, presented with bells and whistles. Click here, I agree. And in a way, it's not so surprising, right? If you have something kind of sneaky to hide, you might as well make sure that it's enforceable. Why? Because nobody reads anyway. So you might as well make sure that when the consumer sues you that you say, look, I was a good guy. I presented this before purchase. Look at those sneaky ones that are actually, what I wonder what those say. And turns out nah, nah, nothing, at least that's much worse than what you're saying. Yeah, and to add to that, the, the practice of presenting the consumers the terms only after they made already the decision and have concluded the purchase or that uh, entry into that transaction um, has to be, uh, sometimes, first of all, it sometimes plays to the benefit of the consumer because what they get is something that they want in the terms. They open the box and for the first time after the purchase, when they come home and install the product or start using it, they realize that they have a warranty in the box. That was not part of the promise made to them at the store, but the warranty is an important component of consumer protection. And it would not be binding if we are unable to find a way for these terms to be adopted post-purchase. The other thing is, you know, many times these terms are limits on the consumer's rights. The terms in the box are provide limitations. And therefore, consumers who are for the, presented with them for the first time after conclusion might have a legitimate complaint. Wait, under these terms, we don't want to be bound. We don't want the transaction. There are not many consumers who read and make have this sentiment, but the few who do are justified in complaining. And therefore, there is a safeguard built into consumer contract law that these shrink wrapped terms, the terms that appear in the box after the conclusion, are only adopted if the consumer has the, the right and the opportunity in any in a meaningful way to review the terms and to decide to withdraw entirely from the transaction if they don't like them. Realizing this is probably a difficult question to answer and there may not really be a good answer, is there a case out there that you could point to that could serve as a nice illustration for our listeners of a contract that was enforced in one of these situations? A case that actually was enforced. I can imagine a, an, an enforceable contract that might create a problem. So, for example, Facebook's contract and many dating sites' contracts. I don't think this is... I don't know can't think of a case, but, but I can think of a situation that has clause that allows a firm to, to conduct experiments with, it, with its users and some dating sites and Facebook has. So in terms of the dating sites, OkCupid, for example, decided to conduct an experiment to test the effectiveness of its algorithm where it decided to, in the user profiles, to turn off certain features of the user. So for example, that might have resulted in, uh, in matches that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So for example, he decided to tune up the political affiliation, in which case somebody who said to be you know, a vegan person living in Portland would be matched up with a big Second Amendment uh, defender. And that resulted in some pretty bad dates. Uh, that might have been pretty bad. And so then some academics wrote papers talking about you know, the, the results of all those algorithms. Or sometimes Facebook decided to see the contagion effect of emotions by, for example, only showing sad posts to some people. And they realized that those people that read only the sad posts were more likely to write sad, <laughs> sad status updates. So that's not so great either. So that might have an effect on your mood, but maybe also your safety if you go out on a date with somebody that you end up having a pretty aggressive or not so nice date with. So in that sense, or then of course there's a Cambridge Analytica uh, example, which everybody can relate to. That's a good example. Will you tell me a little bit about Cambridge Analytica? There are plenty of cases that determine obligations of consumers under loan contracts. Consumer receive money and they give a promise to the bank, to the lender, to the mortgage broker of what, and what will be the procedure and circumstance under which they pay and what fees they pay. 
Um, and all the terms are usually stipulated in a consumer contract that they don't read. They are summarized and the important payments are summarized in disclosure forms and consumers might know what is the monthly payment, but they don't know what the fees are for all sorts of late uh, and prepayment and post payments. And, uh, and sometimes there are dozens and dozens of fees that come up to a lot of money. There is a question, did the consumers agree to these things? How were the terms presented? So that's one example. Another example, it's an anecdote, you ask for an anecdote, is the airline agreement. And if you recall the consumer was his name, Mr. Dow, that was bumped out of, was pulled out yes, of, a, United. of a United flight because they wanted to bring in a crew member that needed a seat and he refused to move. He was brutally pulled out of the plane. Well, you don't need a consumer contract to know that that's not okay behavior. But there is an underlying question whether United was right under the contract to demand that he leave the plane. And that question boils down to the contract that passengers have with United Airlines, with the carrier. And there were provisions there that needed to be interpreted. It wasn't clear cut. So you need rules of interpretation to see what the language in the contract means for that particular circumstance, where what you need is to put not another passenger, it's not an overbooked flight, but a crew member that that pilot that needs to get from one place to another. Furthermore, if when the consumer purchased the ticket, they were did not sign in the contract. The contract was delivered to them oftentimes after the fact or is available as a link on the uh, on united.com to review. Are these terms adopted into the contract in the first place? So these are the questions that come up in a very meaningful and high stakes context. That's really good because it leads right to my next question, which is, what are some of the best practices for consumers, as well as for companies, as they present contracts to consumers? What can each of us do, whether it be under the law or just best practices, to help us protect ourselves? In terms of best practices to increase consumer awareness of the terms, usually advanced disclosure doesn't really help or simplified disclosure doesn't really help. But there's some circumstances where it actually it does. And, and those are, I think, in the context of the mobile setting that just-in-time disclosures have, I believe, and have shown that, that they've helped. So for example, disclosures that affect your decision in the moment without much else. So for example, uh, there's some now when you download an app, it will tell you if you want, for example, to be uh, to, you know, to, to have access to your microphone or to your pictures or to your, your geolocation information. So if it's an app, for example, that is Google Maps, well, then you might want them to give them access to that. But if it's, an, if it's an, a type of app that has nothing to do with where you're located, you might actually deny access to those types of, um, of those very simple targeted in the moment, not overwhelming disclosures that affect your well-being perhaps in, in the moment, that, that might have some uh, promise. My view is that in the most consequential and important contracts where you make a big decision up front that might then later affect your well-being, like consumer credit decisions, decisions to buy big ticket items, where you it's not the ongoing decision whether to take another bite of the transaction or not, but a big, consequential, fateful and dangerous decision that people make. It's very hard to alert people to the entirety of risks and to help them make on their own a prudent, rational, protect, self-protective decision. Uh, notwithstanding endless effort to try to present the risks and the terms to consumers in a meaningful and easy and streamlined way, it largely doesn't work. Uh, I think that in consumer contract law, to the extent that we can identify a pr principled, consistent problems that occur that lead to bad outcomes for consumers. The solution is not to tell the consumers, here is a tool for you to make a better decision next time. The solution should be for lawmakers, for intermediaries, for market mechanisms to develop, send for the law too, in a way that would stop these practices from occurring and to make them uh, illegal, costly, and punishable if necessary, um, so that the consumer feels that they enter into an environment where they can feel safe. So tell me, do you read all of your consumer contracts? No. No. <laughs> Proudly. 
Sometimes I do for research. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I do because I can't help myself. But for the most part, I really don't. I have a hunch that sometimes the companies that dra- that present them to the consumers and even their lawyers don't read, that they cut and paste it from other companies because we've found contracts with typos, oh, yeah. with um, clearly been a patchwork Rehashed. of yeah. Yeah, re- rehash terms. Sometimes even in-house lawyers don't read their own contracts. Like These are some very big firm, and I was studying how the contract changed over time, and at the end I said, you know, you really cut the contract. I was like, yes, management wanted me to cut the contract. And I said, and this is a B2B contract, like, why did you... Um, why did you remove the choice of um, forum clause? You know, it doesn't make any sense given... And then he said, I did? <laughs> so, you know. I'm reminded of the New Jersey Supreme Court where at a moment in oral argument, the chief justice at the time looked at the contract, an insurance contract, and said, I don't understand what it means. I, they say one thing, and then they say the opposite, and then they say another thing, and then the other, another Supreme Court justice said, yeah, I never understand these contracts, and a third chime, chimes in, I never read these contracts. <laughs> so I think that consumers should not feel that there's anything wrong with them not reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo and I'm Sean Kellum.